Hi, it's DeWire. This is part two of the video on A.J. Armstrong. Keep in mind, this is an opinion. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. So, at 1.40 in the morning, A.J. Armstrong has called the police. He tells the police that he's heard sounds that could be gunshots coming from his parents' bedroom and that he's in the house. Right? The cops show up six minutes later. Remember that number. Six minutes later. They're there quick, folks. AJ has to let them in. The house alarm is still on. So he has to disengage the house alarm to let them in, which he does. Right? So the cops come in. The cops go up to the parents' bedroom, and the cops notice what looks to be a burn mark, a black mark, on the carpet right at the top of the stairs, where if his parents were to leave the house, they would have to go by. Then when they go in the bedroom, they find the couple killed, shot in the head, in their bed, execution style, with pillows on top of them. Now, of course, the cops noticed too on the first floor, in the kitchen area, there's the murder weapon. And, of course, there's a note. And the note says, I've been watching you for some time. And it looks like some drawers have been pulled out and gone through. Right? Of course, A.J. tells the cops that he went and got his sister, his 12-year-old sister, who was fast asleep. He woke her up to make sure that she was safe. And, of course, he made sure she was safe. He goes and gets her. The cops search the house, right? Now, keep in mind, they're there six minutes after the call. And the cops find nothing that would indicate a break-in, right? The cops find nothing that would indicate an exit. In other words, folks... The house is pristine from the aspect of whether an intruder broke into the house, right? And, of course, the murder weapon, which is left in plain sight in the kitchen on the first floor, turns out to be A.J.'s father's gun. And, of course, it has no DNA and no fingerprints on it. Right now... Let's point out why A.J. is obviously guilty here. Right? Understand, with most of these crimes, the vast majority that I look into, the actual perpetrator makes mistakes. Right? Even well-thought-out murders, you'll find that the perpetrator has made mistakes. Right? In Idaho... There's the knife sheath left next to one of the murder victims, right? There's the car, which is the perpetrator's car, or at least the suspect's car, in the neighborhood, caught on surveillance film. This is after the perp has disengaged their phone, right? Well, we have the video of the perp's car near the crime scene. Well, here, A.J. makes some colossal mistakes. The first one, the first one, is the staging on the first floor. Right, folks? It doesn't match the timeline. If I call the cops at 140, and I say, hey, I've heard sounds in my parents' bedroom." Right? How is it possible that parents' bedrooms are on the second floor? How would it be possible for the killer to have killed two people on the second floor, then gone down the stairs, decided after the shooting 
that they're going to go through draws downstairs. They're going to write a note that, of course, as in the John Bonet case, is from a pad that's in the house. They're going to write a note saying, I've been watching you, right? Come get me. Words to that effect. They're going to take the time, and this is a big mistake, to leave the murder weapon on the first floor. Then they're going to somehow get out of the house without tripping the house alarm and do so in such a way where there's no sign that an intruder was there. No broken window. No open door. And they're going to do all of that, folks. All of that. In six minutes. That doesn't make sense. Let's talk about a huge subpart of that. That's a major mistake. The gun being left on the first floor. Understand, the minute you do that, you rule out the idea of an intruder in the house who then kills the parents after ruffling through stuff on the first floor. Understand, that couldn't have happened because the intruder would then have to come back to the kitchen area to leave the murder weapon. Keep in mind, too, if we believe that the intruder is in the kitchen first, then the intruder is taking the time to write out a note after ruffling through the kitchen drawers. Now, if the intruder took stuff from the kitchen drawers, wouldn't the intruder want to leave with that stuff? No. Here, we're supposed to believe the intruder ruffles through the kitchen drawers, right? Takes the time to write a note before doing anything in the house in terms of committing a murder. Then the intruder in a house with several bedrooms, Right? AJ has one, his sister has one, the parents are in their own. You're there after 1 a.m. If you have been watching the family for some time, you know they have a 16-year-old in the house. You know there's a 12-year-old in the house. You understand you can't linger if you're in the house to kill two people It has to be surgical and quick. You can't afford having someone see you. Well, we're supposed to believe that the shooter leaves the kitchen, goes upstairs, kills the parents, and then comes back downstairs because they've already planned to leave the murder weapon next to the note that they've taken time to write after breaking into the house and leaving no signs of a break-in in a house that has an alarm. Then we're supposed to believe that that person magically slips out of the house without leaving any sign of ever being in the house or of ever leaving the house. So when the cops come minutes later, that person is long gone. Folks, it, it doesn't make sense. A.J. planned this, in my opinion, and blew the sequencing. It's even worse than that. The alarm system has motion detectors. The alarm system can actually tell you when someone was moving on different floors. So let's go through the timeline because it's disturbing. I don't believe a jury has to move off anything else. The sequencing doesn't work. We find out that AJ's on his phone until 102. Right? He's on his phone. He's a teenager until after one. Right, folks? His parents are killed within the hour. Now, understand. He plugs his phone into a charger at 1.04 a.m. We know this from the phone. 
Now, if it stayed in the charger, then you would say, okay, well, he didn't have his phone with him. When whatever happened, happened. Folks, it doesn't stay in the charger. The phone is unplugged at 1.08 a.m. Now, AJ's bedroom's on the third floor. Folks, the second floor motion detector is triggered at 1.09 a.m. In other words, AJ is on the move. He takes his phone. One minute, one minute after his phone is taken off the charger, the motion detector on the second floor is triggered. In other words, he's on the second floor. Now understand, we now know, based on the software readings on the phone, that the light is on, on the phone, right? The screen is on. Why would the screen be on in AJ's own house, right? If you're home and you need some light, don't you just walk over to the light switch and turn it on? Why would the screen on your phone stay on? It's because A.J. doesn't want the lights to come on. He's walking around on the same floor where his parents are killed. He's walking around at 109 and he's using the screen of his phone for light. Right now, let me just point out that we know the sequencing here just based on the house alarm's motion sensors. I believe AJ kills his parents, not at 140, but around 109, right? That's when he takes the phone off the charger. He's using the light on his phone. I believe he has dad's gun with him. Now understand, AJ, of course, is the last person before this incident known to have had dad's gun. AJ is the last person before this. I'm calling it an incident. It's a double murder, folks. AJ is the last person we know of who fired the gun. So I believe AJ has his phone out and is using the screen for light. He's keeping it dark in his own home. And in the other hand, I believe he has dad's weapon, which we know he had a few days earlier when he fired that weapon into a pillow in his own room. Would it surprise you too to know that AJ on the third floor apparently fired a bullet through the floor of his own room that somehow made it into the ceiling of his parents' room. Folks, I don't know about you, I can't imagine any scenario. Any scenario where I'm firing a gun in the direction of my parents' bedroom that doesn't involve some intruder coming at me and it being life or death and me taking out the gun and aiming at the intruder uh, at the intruder and then having the bullet go where it goes right understand AJ admits to having the gun in his room and to having the gun go off earlier. And of course, where was the bullet headed? Toward his parents' bedroom. Well, I believe if you read the motion detection record for the house alarm, you know what happens here. He's in his room. 
He takes the phone off the charger at 108. He has it with him. He goes to the second floor, right? His bedroom's on the third floor. He goes to the second floor. He has the gun with him. He doesn't want the lights on. He enters his parents' bedroom. He kills mom first because, of course, that's the parent who he had the truly tumultuous relationship with. He doesn't kill dad first, even though dad's a former NFL linebacker. He shoots mom, then he shoots dad. So then, would it surprise you to know, and this is my opinion, it's America, I'm entitled to my opinion. Would it surprise you to know that the first floor motion sensor is activated at 1.25 a.m.? In other words, his parents are dead. He hasn't called 911 yet. No, he goes to the first floor. That's when the first floor motion detector is activated. That's when he with the murder weapon, that he is wiped down so thoroughly. Perhaps he wore gloves. Perhaps he's wearing a plastic bag. That's all it takes, folks, to avoid having gunpowder residue all over you. Perhaps he's wearing a plastic bag, right? He has one of those big hefties, and he makes it into a smock, right? He figured out how to ditch that, have the gun not have DNA on it, not have fingerprints on it. Folks, the gun is too pristine. And, of course, he writes the note, leaves the note and the gun on the counter, right? The motion detector is activated at 125. He has 15 minutes. 15 minutes to stage the first floor. So then he calls the cops at 140. Right, says, hey, I heard gunshots. Right, by the time that call is made, folks, his parents have already been killed. Here's where the whole thing falls apart. Right? He's trying to act like he's terrified and, you know, he's hearing sounds. He immediately calls the cops. He's not going anywhere because the intruder might be at the crib still. Unfortunately, the cops didn't take 15 minutes to show up. They didn't take half an hour to show up, where you could argue that maybe the perp and is still in the building, but somehow it slipped out in that 15 to 30 minute time period. No, folks, just like in the Darley Rotier case, where the cops show up in three to four minutes. Here, the cops show up in six minutes. How do we know? Because, folks, the house is still alarm protected. It's at 1.46 a.m. that A.J. has to disengage the house alarm so he can let the cops come inside. So let me just say this. Oh, Lord knows he's polished, just like OJ, just like Bill Cosby. Right? Wow, he sounds great. You notice he doesn't seem to have a lot of emotion when he talks. But he sounds great. He sounds articulate. He sounds grateful. There's dysfunction all over the place. Had his parents had an opportunity to run out of the bedroom, let's say the gunman comes into the bedroom and the parents are able to, you know, get the gunman out of the way, linebacker grabs his wife, right? They blow by the gunman and they're running down the stairs. Well, they would have to leave down the stairs. Now, there's a black mark at the top of the stairs understand what that black mark is. A.J. lies to the cops, claims he had a problem with a match at the top of the stairs. 
we find out later that apparently AJ, and this doesn't happen randomly, this shows the level of depravity and planning. Apparently AJ brought gasoline home with him, put it in a rubbing alcohol bottle. Then when no one was around, he put gasoline at the top of the stairs. The prosecution has a theory, and I believe it's right. This is a kid who was planning to kill his parents one way or another. Right? One of the ways he was planning on killing his parents was to set the top of the stairs on fire to possibly burn down the house. Right? AJ's a trust fund kid. He did the math and realized, hey, if mom and dad are no longer with us, right, I have a 12-year-old sister, my brother is a schizophrenic, I'm going to get a lot of the money, and I'm going to get some fiduciary responsibilities in terms of managing that money. So understand, the black mark at the top of the stairs is very important. While A.J. didn't set it on fire that night, it's black. Something happened where he made an attempt. He told the cops already he had an accident involving a match. Folks, is it an accident when you're bringing gasoline into the house? And you're putting that gasoline at the top of the stairs where, necessarily, your parents would have to exit? It's worse than that. AJ had an iPad. Would it shock you to know that on his iPad, he was researching how to blow up a car? He wanted a scene like the scene at the beginning of the Martin Scorsese film, Casino, where... His parents go into the car, they're on their way to church or the grocery store. Dad turns the keys and the car blows up. Folks, why would you look up how to set a car bomb unless you're planning to set a car bomb? Right, as I said before, AJ's not a typical teen here, folks. He's a psycho, in my opinion. Right, this is a guy who was deeply unhappy. His parents had cut him off financially, took away his Mustang. His longtime girlfriend, who he's been with for years, is out at parties without him. He's no longer the star of the private school football team he was on. It's even worse than that. His parents kicked him out of his private school. They stopped paying because he wasn't getting the grades. So here he is, 16, young black male in Houston, Texas. Right, He's aware of the fact that there are many young black men in America making a fraction, if you believe the numbers, in terms of compensation, in terms of standard of living. As their white counterparts, he realizes, hey, he, you know, his family's first generation out of the hood. He could well fall back into the hood. Mom and dad are on his case I believe he then decides to off mom and dad. Again, there are four people in the house. Sister is 12, and she's fast asleep. Two of the people in the house are mom and dad who are murder victims. Right? We know it's not a murder-suicide because the weapon, the murder weapon, dad's gun, is on the first floor next to a cheesily written note that's on a piece of paper taken from the house.
We also know that the motion detector on the second floor where his parents are found, this is the house alarm system, activates at 109, one minute after, one minute after AJ takes his phone off the charger. 109. We know the first floor motion detector goes off at 125. We know AJ calls the police at 140. We know when the police arrive six minutes later. There's no sign of a break-in. Folks, there's no sign of an exit. The best cat burglars you know of couldn't come in and get out that efficiently. So, understand what AJ's great attorneys come up with. His brother, who is living with mental illness, who has a girlfriend, who lives with his girlfriend, not far from the residence, gets a call from AJ that night. Right? The brother runs over to the house. He's outside, right, with other family members who hear that something happened at the house. It's a close family. They all show up. They're outside, right? As the cops discover the bodies in the house, right? So, of course, AJ's defense team, knowing that they have to explain away the fact that someone was able to work around the house alarm system, if they're going to argue that someone outside of the house did this. They decide that they're going to accuse AJ's older brother, Josh, of this double homicide. Right now, Josh, at that point, has his schizophrenia under control. His girlfriend, who's incredibly honest, completely believes that Josh had nothing to do with the murder, but she admits she was fast asleep at 1 to 2 in the morning. And so she can't completely eliminate, even though she's a light sleeper, the idea that Josh may have left while she was fast asleep and she may not have noticed it. Right, so understand AJ's defense is to accuse his brother, who had schizophrenia, who's so close to the family that the brother, of course, when AJ earlier said, hey, let me hang with you and stuff, said, no, mom and dad wouldn't like that, right? The brother goes along with trading his truck for AJ's Mustang when the parents ask him to, right? Understand, Josh is close to his parents, he has moved out. He's living with his girl. There's no evidence that Josh comes in and disengages the house alarm system. No such evidence whatsoever. Understand, Josh, because he's outside of the murder scene with other family members, as the cops are in the house going through the crime scene, he's asked by the police to give a gunshot residue test on his hands. And of course, Josh has no gunpowder residue on his hands. Right, none. We're supposed to believe that this schizophrenic brother, knowing that his younger brother, AJ, and his sister live at the house, that AJ's on his phone constantly. This night, AJ doesn't get off his phone until 1.02 a.m. We're supposed to believe that Josh decides, hey, let me come in the house. Let me get dad's gun. Now, understand, 
the person who last had dad's gun that we know of is AJ. AJ had it in his room. When he fires a shot through a pillow and blankets toward his parents' bedroom that left a hole in his floor and a hole in the ceiling of his parents' bedroom that he covered up with socks that he lied about to the cops, right? He tells the cops, hey, my friends were over and they wanted to see how a gun works and things got a little bit out of hand. Then he later has to say, well, you know, actually my friends weren't over because he understood the cops would want to speak to his friends. Then he said, hey, I just wanted to see how the gun works. Understand Josh is the last person, excuse me, AJ is the last person known to have the gun, not Josh. Understand, too, A.J. lies about the gun to the police. The police say, hey, did you ever have your dad's gun? And A.J. says, yeah, you know, when I was eight, he gave me the gun. I believe we were out in a field or at a shooting range or some, some convoluted story. And then, of course, we come to learn that dad didn't have the gun when A.J. was eight. Dad, dad, dad only had the gun the last three years. Right, so you have A.J. lying to the cops. You have him accusing his brother of doing stuff that's just ridiculous. If the brother lives with his girlfriend, why would he decide to kill his parents knowing that his girlfriend might be able to say, hey, he left our bedroom shortly after one in the morning to go to his parents' house. Why would his brother show up knowing that his younger brother might still be awake and then kill his parents, hang around the house, go to the first floor, leave the murder weapon posed next to a note, write a note, do you believe that happened? Understand, folks, no one sees Josh, the 19-year-old schizophrenic, wearing gloves, entering the house after 1 a.m. Understand how preposterous it is. Folks, the family lived in that house for some time. Josh is known in the neighborhood. Really, I'm going to believe that Josh shows up and, you know, somehow is able to leave no DNA, no fingerprints, without being seen entering the house. No one sees him, right? His brother turns off his phone at 102, right? 102 that morning. I'm supposed to believe that Josh somehow shows up is able to locate the gun that his brother had last, goes in the room, kills his parents, and then decides, you know what I'm going to do? After killing my parents in a house where my siblings are there and can easily, easily identify me, I'm going to go down to the first floor. I'm going to ruffle through some drawers, even though I would be an heir to the estate. I'm going to ruffle through some drawers to make this look like a burglary. But I'm also going to leave a note so people understand I'm not just some fly-by-night burglar. That note's going to say, I've been watching you. So they'll know I actually planned this and stalked this. Then I'm going to leave the gun downstairs. And I'm going to find a way to do all of that within six minutes after the murder. Because the cops are there six minutes later. And I'm going to find a way to exit without disengaging the alarm, but without activating the alarm. And I'm going to do so in a way where there's no point of exit that the cops can point to. Let's also look a little bit harder at the arguments raised by A.J.'s attorney. Understand. One of Dad's gyms got broken into a few days after all of this. And, of course, 
the crooks were caught on surveillance camera. And Rick DeToto wanted to argue that it looks like the crooks in a gym that has big screen TVs are hanging around the desk area looking for something. Right now, of course, they take a computer from the gym. But the idea is that they were looking for something. Because the dad, the master of the universe, right, the patriarch of the family, the dad, the inference is, was involved in things under the radar. Right? There's some woman who gave an interview to the police who claimed that the dad might be involved in a prostitution ring. So understand AJ's defense. It's in essence to blame the dad for his own murder and to blame his schizophrenic older brother for dad's murder. Right, folks, it's desperation. They're throwing sticks of butter on the wall here, hoping something sticks. So let's talk about the mistakes, and there are several that A.J. made, right? I believe he did this killing and forgot about the alarm. So when the cops show up, and can't get in, and he has to disengage the alarm. That highlights the fact that the house was protected by the alarm that night. Another mistake A.J. made is he makes a 911 call. Sounds convincing, right? Hey, I'm hearing noises from my parents' room. Right? I don't know what's going on in there, basically, but I'm hearing noises that could be gunshots. And I'm in the house, and I'm worried. Please come. But yet later when he's talking to the police, he makes the claim that he saw a shadowy figure in the house. Right? You would have thought this was the fugitive. Well, if you saw a shadowy figure in your house, either before or after, immediately before or after, you hear what could be gunshots in your parents' bedroom. Wouldn't that be one of the first things you tell the police? Think about how you would handle it. Wouldn't you be on the phone and you would say, hey, I heard gunshots in my parents' bedroom after seeing a stranger in the house, or I heard gunshots in my parents' bedroom, then I saw a stranger, an intruder in the house. Please come. Wouldn't that be what you would focus on? Wouldn't that be something you would want the police to know? Here in the 911 call, AJ doesn't mention an intruder. That part is scotch taped on later when he's talking to the police. Also, the kitchen. Folks, that's a bad idea from jump. Right? If the argument is that dad was involved in some under-the-table dealings. Why do you need the kitchen staging? Wouldn't the hitman just come in, kill dad, mom's collateral damage, kill mom because she's next to dad, and then leave? Right? Why, why would we believe that the killer would go to the kitchen area at that point and... Pull out drawers. What was he looking to find? A spatula? He's going to pull out drawers in the kitchen. Then he's going to hang around and take the time after killing two people in a house that had four people. He's going to take the time to write a note saying, I've been watching you. Write a note that says, come get me to the police. A note that doesn't make sense in the context. Right? The kitchen staging is over the top. And, of course, we know from the monitors off the house alarm that that takes place 
16 minutes after the motion detector goes off on the second floor. Then we have the motion detector going off on the first floor. Really, you've just killed two people in a house with four people. You're going to stick around and write a note? Not only that, just like in the John Binet case, the note is written in the house because the paper comes from a pad in the house. So I have this planned crime and I'm going to show up with the idea of not having a note I can just put on the counter. No, I'm going to show up determined to leave a note but not have one with me. So I'm going to kill two people, then I'm going to go to the first floor and I'm going to write the note. After I go through the drawers, to what? Find kitchen utensils? It makes no sense. Also, the cops come. You're being questioned by the cops later. Your parents have been shot to death. There's a hole in the floor of your room, a bullet hole, from when you fired the gun just a few days earlier, right? Of course, you fired the gun through a pillow. In other words, you didn't want the gun to make a lot of noise when you fired it. This was a dry run. So the cops asked you, hey, have you used dad's gun lately? Have you touched dad's gun? And you're going to come up with some story where, yeah, you did, but it was a long time ago. Right? You're not going to tell the cops up front. Yeah, I fired that gun a few days ago in my bedroom toward my parents' bedroom. Right? Folks, this is what happens with narcissistic psychopaths. The guy is trying to hide the hole in the floor of his bedroom with some dirty socks over it. He didn't seem to realize that Houston police were going to actually examine the house and that he would have to admit that he fired the gun. It's worse than that. He talks about friends. He has a construct. Yeah, you know, friends came over, they wanted to see a gun and stuff. Then, of course, you later find out there were no friends with him. AJ didn't seem to appreciate or realize that whatever he said, the cops were going to follow up and investigate further. Because, of course, we were talking about murder times two. Let's talk about other things, too. He has some parts of the crime planned, in my opinion, right? So the cops say, hey, we're not going to find gunshot residue on you, are we? And he says, no, nah, no, nah, no, you're not going to find any gunshot residue. No doubt the brother had on gloves or something like that. So as not to leave fingerprints on the gun, so as not to have gunpowder residue on him. Right? There was no gunpowder residue on AJ. The problem is, AJ's wearing a shirt. Bullets are made of lead. There's some lead on the right side of the shirt he was wearing. Right? Understand, whatever he had on to prevent gunpowder residue from getting on him, it seems he was wearing that shirt while dealing with some bullets. Let's talk about another problem he has. He's a high school kid, plays on the football team, right? Is hoping to be a professional athlete. He has a girlfriend. Why would he look up on his iPad how to blow up a car? Right, folks, he looks up on his iPad how to blow up a car. Now, this is the same youth who has a hole in the floor of his bedroom on a bullet that apparently was traveling toward his parents' bedroom, left a hole in the ceiling of his parents' bedroom, right? We come to find out that he was looking up 
how to have a car blow up. Well, then we get the coup de grace, the black mark at the top of the stairs. Okay, you know, we were all teenagers. Maybe he was smoking, dropped a match, dropped a cigarette. Okay, I'll buy that. How does gas accidentally end up in your house? How does gasoline end up on the carpet at the top of the stairs? And then, of course, there's a burn mark there. It's not just like gas was there. Someone tried to light the gasoline. So let's add it up. This is a guy who has problems, who seems to be researching how much noise dad's gun makes when fired to the point where he fires dad's gun in his own bedroom days before this awful double murder. And of course, in what direction was he firing the gun? Not out the window, no, in the direction of his parents' bedroom. He also happens to be researching car bombs on, on his iPad. Then, of course, there's the other idea, arson. Right where? Right at the top of the stairway. So, suddenly the place is on fire, Mom and Dad can't get through the arson, can't get through the fire. They would perish in the fire. So I believe this is a deep psycho. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just looking at the facts, making extrapolations, giving you my opinion. I believe this is a deep psycho who hated his parents. Right? The public persona is, hey, I'm a loving son, and you know, we'll get through this. Yeah, you know, I'm smoking weed, but I'm 16. What's the big deal? Mom and dad forced me to leave the private school. That's all right. I wasn't getting great grades in the private school. Right? To the world, he comes across as a shoulder shrugger. Right? Someone who, you know, is just going with the flow. Right? Is having typical teenage problems with his parents. You know, the anger is much deeper than that. You know, the deception is much deeper than that. Let me point out, too. He lied to his girlfriend. He has some story going on with his girlfriend where he claimed that he went to his dad for advice. We know this from the text messages. Right, he claims that he went to his dad for advice. And then, of course, you know, after having some loving conversation with his dad, the girlfriend's convinced she heard mom and dad laughing in the background. Right, he left his parents' bedroom and went down to his room. Here's the problem. The motion detector isn't triggered for his parents' floor during the time period in which A.J. is supposed to have gone and talked with his dad. The story is bogus, but yet that's the story he's feeding his girlfriend. Right? So, of course, his defense is arguing that this could have been blowback from some undercover stuff dad was into. Right? This is the kind of rumor and speculation you get when you're a successful black male, master of the universe, who has moved your family out of the hood into the upper middle class part of town, right? Dad's business may have been shady. Someone may have come in the house to knock him off. And of course, would then be silly enough to be leaving notes and, you know, staging the kitchen uh, after killing the man and his wife. Right, that's one theory. The other theory is, hey, my brother is mentally ill. Um, the alarm doesn't support 
an intruder because my brother knows how to work the alarm and he probably came in and killed my parents. Right? There's no evidence that shows any problems between his older brother and his parents. Also, you have to ask yourself, at what point does the murder become too sophisticated for someone dealing with mental health schizophrenia? Right? And, of course, you have to ask yourself, if the brother lives nearby in his own apartment with his babe, who is going to decide, you know what? Even though my babe might actually hear the door shut as I leave, even though my woman could awaken after I've left and realize I'm not there and blow my alibi, I'm going to use this opportunity to go kill my parents, even though, even though people in the neighborhood know me, right? I would be seen entering the house by neighborhood folks, perhaps someone in this upper middle class neighborhood has a security camera, right? In the Idaho murders, we know different buildings had surveillance cameras. You're in the upper middle class part of town. If any camera caught Josh entering the family home moments before his parents got killed, he'd be a serious suspect, wouldn't he? Any move he does with the home alarm system would be noted on the home alarm system. Right? So, of course, AJ's attorney say, hey, the home alarm system was garbage. Right? Even though the home alarm system is working that night, when the cops come, they can't get in. Guess why? Because the door is locked. No one disengages the home alarm system that night until AJ does at 1.46 a.m. When the cops arrive. So, from this scene, let me applaud the prosecutor's office in Houston for deciding to try this guy a third time. Right? I want to be clear. We as a society should not be tolerating teenagers killing their parents. Right? Your parents trying to help you. When the parent says, son, you're not applying yourself academically. I'm taking your car away from you. You're not getting grades in this private school. We're going to have you go to public school. Give yourself a chance to apply yourself academically. Right, son? We're not going to allow you to go hit these parties with your girlfriend because you're not taking care of your academic responsibilities. I got news for you. His parents were good parents. His parents loved him. His parents are trying to help him. We as a society can't look the other way. When a kid like this kills his parents, especially when the kid then has the audacity to be lying to the police, right? Oh, I, I touched my dad's gun when I was eight, when dad didn't have the gun. Right? We know the kid's up because the kid's phone doesn't go off until 102. One of his mistakes was he didn't realize that software on phones is so developed now that we can actually tell when a phone has been taken off the charger. His phone's taken off the charger at 108. Independently, the alarm system notes the motion detector goes off for the second floor at 109. Who's on that second floor? In my eyes, in my opinion, it's A.J. Armstrong. So, brother, I'm sorry. You can come across like OJ. You can come across as smooth. You can come across as principled, like Bill Cosby comes across as principled. Right? The facts are the facts. There are four people in the house. Your 12-year-old sister didn't kill your parents. The parents didn't kill themselves because the murder weapon is downstairs. It's not in their bedroom. Your 911 call is a sham. It doesn't mention an intruder. Who makes a 911 call and doesn't mention an intruder? 
The story you come up with later is bogus, right? Socks over a bullet hole that you did with dad's gun in your own room? Where was that bullet headed? Toward your parents' bedroom? Of all the places in the world. The gun goes off, right? He wanted to see. He's using a pillow to shoot the gun through. He wanted to hear the gun. The gun goes off and the bullet, according to the holes, appears to have traveled into his parents' bedroom. Of all the places in the world, that's the direction he's shooting in. Right? I don't know how this kid goes to sleep at night. Dad's just been brutally murdered. Dad, the guy who self-made, the guy who was a football star, got the family out the hood. Right, The guy who decides he's going to be an entrepreneur has businesses going on. And you mean to tell me you're even going to raise the suggestion that dad was doing shady things and that someone may have come to kill dad? That's a desperate defendant, isn't it? The collateral damage is all around. His sister doesn't have her loving parents. Great set of parents. The brother apparently was managing his schizophrenia, right? Had a serious live-in girlfriend. After losing his parents, the brother at 19, brother named Josh, loses it, is having major mental health problems. And so in front of a jury, you authorize your lawyers to read parts of his medical records and you try to accuse him of doing this murder, hey, from this seat, that's disgraceful. I hope the prosecution is more successful this time. Quite frankly, I hope this guy, this defendant, decides to save the state of Texas, the heavy money that will be required to try him a third time. I applaud the prosecutors for going after him a third time. In my opinion, they know he's guilty. Right? I believe the case is cut and dry. Right, Pouty teenager loses access to his Mustang, loses access to his private school social circle. Right, Panics, he feels he's the next great athlete. Uh, he loses his private school football team. Now he's roughing it in public school. Right, resents dad and mom, was born on third base, has no idea how hard it was for dad to make it out the hood. Then, of course, it's sad. You got extended family. They're looking at the situation. They don't want this young man to be another young black man in the criminal justice system. Right? I believe many of them know things don't add up. But they understand that this young guy with problems might really have problems in prison. Right? So just know, I don't consider this to be a close case. I think this is obviously a double homicide by the defendant. That's my opinion. Right? I haven't heard anything from the defense, and I like his lawyer. But I haven't heard anything from the defense that makes sense, given the motion sensor information we have from the house alarm system, and given defendant's 911 call that doesn't mention an intruder, and the lies defendant gave to the police. Also, the whole affect is off. The guy doesn't stop and say, damn, man, you know, my dad was my hero. You know, how the hell could this happen? You know, there's, there's no appreciation, no real empathy toward either murder victim in his conversation with law enforcement. Right? I think he did this crime. We'll see how this plays out. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.